Hey, today we're going to talk about one of my very favorite comics from the 80s. You know, the 80s were a really interesting time in comics, right? Um, that's when comics first started, people first started saying uh, comics aren't just for kids anymore, right? And you'd see these articles in the newspaper. Most of those started coming after books like uh, Dark Knight Returns by Frank Miller, Watchmen by uh, Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons. Um, so they got a ton of credit for that and often a lot of blame for what happened to comics going grim and gritty and whatever. But there was another comic in the 80s before all those. Go all the way back to 1982. We're talking before uh, the black and white boom. This was a superhero book, undoubtedly. Look, looking at it, you'd have no doubt it was a superhero book. But it was unlike any other superhero book either before or after. Now I'm talking about... Bill Willingham's Elementals. So today on Comic Book News, we're going to talk about this book, um, why it's kind of hard to find and very obscure, but uh, undoubtedly one of the most influential and important indie books in comics history. Hello. Today we're going to talk about uh, Bill Willingham uh, and his book, The Elementals. Now, uh, if you're a comic book reader, you probably know uh, Mr. Willingham from his work on Fables. This is a work, uh, a, a, a long running series from a Vertigo slash DC Comics, right? And it adapted, sort of took a, um, a postmodern approach to fairy tale characters, something that we've seen in other comics and even other media before, but never sort of in the way that Willingham is able to do it. Um, he's come out and said in interviews that uh, uh, the story is actually kind of a metaphor for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We're not going to get into his politics. Uh, instead, we're going to talk about my favorite work of his, the work that he was first and best known for before Fables, and that's The Elementals. Um, but how did he get his start in the industry, right? Willingham's first, some of his first published works was in the uh, role-playing game illustration business. Illustration? Yeah, that's right. Willingham is an accomplished artist as well as a writer. I think he's probably a better writer, maybe a faster writer, but he's definitely a very qualified um, penciler and inker. Does fantastic work in a style reminiscent of, in my opinion, of Michael Golden, who, um, as we'll see, there's a connection to. So his uh, one of his first uh, jobs after um, Dungeons and Dragons was working on um, a, a kind of an obscure '80s superhero role-playing game called Villains and Vigilantes. So he created a module for that, and one of the uh, the the villains in this particular module were uh, a group called the Destroyers, right? And, and, and these are characters uh, that would later become villains um, in the Elemental series. Uh, the first appearance of the Elementals was in Justice Machine Annual number one from Texas Comics. Who? Never heard of them. This is the only issue um, of this series that came out from Texas Comics, but it... Um, it's a beautiful book. It's got a cover which I just learned is is is, is penciled by Michael Golden, um, and that explains like how attractive it is just right off the bat. This is it's a it, it uh, it's a wraparound cover which um, all of the Elementals issues and many many of the Komiko books, if not all of the Komiko comics, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, um, had these beautiful wraparound colors covers, and not just wraparound covers, full color interiors with coloring that was far superior to what was going on in either Marvel or DC. I mean, it's we'll take a look at it, but it's in 1983, it is better than what Marvel was laying down in 1993 easily and and maybe even longer than that. So, um the first Comico issue. Now you this has been a back issue staple for many years. You can find this around. It used to run for like 9 or 10 bucks or something like that. Never super expensive. Um, but not cheap either because it's sought after because it's good. Um, it, it was a wraparound cover. The other half is the Destroyer's half. Um, but this is an iconic image of, of the four main characters who, uh, who we'll talk about. Uh, this went through like 30 issues, the first series. And then it was relaunched with an all-new number one. 
uh, in a second series by Kamiko. Now this one didn't feature interior art by Willingham. He did some of the covers and it had interior art by Mike Leake and Mike Chen. And by now Willingham had transitioned to pretty much being um, almost solely a writer. He's still done some, he does some art here and there, covers and, and even interiors now and again. Um, and then there was the third series. Unfortunately, we'll talk a little bit about the publishing history. So went through some ownership struggles. They tried to relaunch it and tried to go in some really weird and semi-sleazy directions with the characters. So let's just call Elemental Series 3 sort of like uh, Godfather Season 3. Or uh, the, the third Godfather movie, right? The first two, brilliant and groundbreaking, wonderful, rewatchable again and again. The third, man, eh, you can skip it. There were um, a lot of different individual specials, even for all the individual characters. But let's talk about the four main elemental characters. Um, so, uh, Morningstar. Jeanette Crane, she was a, a LAPD officer uh, who died in a fire. Tough as nails. Talk about strong female characters. This is one of the most uh, strong, uh, fully defined, fully realized female characters in comics. And this is 1984. Fathom, Rebecca Golden, she drowned in an accident uh, and um, like the other characters was uh, 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 um, came brought back to life by uh, the, the natural order, the forces of nature, the elementals to um, fight a great evil that was coming. She has amazing water power. She can turn into water as well as um, controlling water like a, a, on, a, on a sort of like a, a tsunami level. Um, Tommy Shujura, also known as Monolith, giant kind of rocky thing looking dude, but a really great character. Um, very highly intelligent young man, the youngest of the elementals. He's actually, his body is still a kid um, when he died and he was crushed by rocks um, and came back and with the ability to transform into Monolith. But the elemental characters, after their deaths and resurrections, they don't age. So Tommy has stayed locked in this child's sort of prepubescent pubescent body and, that, and and that's a source of um more story ideas that that come later on in the series tommy's highly intelligent not arguably he is the most highly intelligent member of the team and uh, he's recognized as such um by the villain saker who we'll talk about um the the fourth and final of the elementals is jeff murphy also known as vortex uh, he can fly uh and has sort of like control over the air and wind and um another really fully realized interesting character he was an emt formerly a vietnam vet has some sort of like slight uh ptsd that sort of factors in um to his character and um you know together these four were all killed and resurrected at the same time brought back to life to fight evil to fight the coming evil um of saker lord saker Saker's a really interesting villain. Um, we get to know his origin in the first few issues of The Elementals, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. And it's really one of the cooler origins in comics. It's tied to a real-life religion and history. Some might even call it blasphemous. Um, but man, as a kid, reading this as 14 or whatever, when I read finally read this, I didn't read it as it was originally coming out, but I caught up with it as I became a comics fan. This was the kind of thing that was like, wow, I've never read anything like this in a superhero comic, or even any comic for that matter. Um, another great villain um, is uh, the character known only as Shapeshifter. She's another sort of immortal character who, who we learn way, way later about her origin. She began life in, as like a prehistoric fish that could change shape and change forms, and she's just been alive as this sort of like predator through the millennia and she can uh she, you know she's kind of like mystique type character can um change shape but uh willingham managed to pull off one of the most amazing uh shocking surprising um uses of this character that i've ever read in a comic and it was um it was brilliant um so uh elementals has been collected in a trade paperback if if you can believe that right um because this was we're talking about um 1988 
the first trade paperback was published. And l l let's take a quick look at it, right? I've got it here on the Million Dollar Comics Cam. This is Elementals, The Natural Order. You can find this in, in comic book stores. You can find it online, in, in, in Amazon and stuff. And this is the first printing. The comics came out in 83, but this was printed in 1988. It's a full-color trade paperback. And it's got the first five issues of the Elementals. Now, this is revolutionary because in 1988, nobody was reprinting stuff in trade paper, or hardly anyone. Very rare. I mean, even the big two uh, didn't do it often. And not with this beautiful, kind of gorgeous uh, coloring. Uh, for the time, gorgeous anyway. It's you know, it's not. It's a, we we take for granted with computer coloring of this day, but at this time, this was some of the most attractive, best-looking comics on the stand, and the story was mature on a level that comics never were before. Certainly not superhero comics, right? You could read underground comics or independent comics of, of different nature, but this was. You look at this, and this looks like a superhero book. But you pick it up, and these characters are swearing. There, uh, there's gruesome violence. There's, uh, they have sex, and as the series goes on, sex becomes kind of a more prominent feature of the series, and it begins to go off the rails as Willingham sort of um, distanced himself from the series, if you will. So, Comico really ahead of their time in the collecting of their comics, um, uh, the production of their comics, and the collection of your com of their comics, and. You know, names like uh, Bob Schreck and Diana Schutz, who later on, you know, went to work at Dark Horse Comics and produced some of the amazing uh, indie comics, too, sort of uh, cut their teeth on this stuff. Um, now, Comico put out some other amazing comics. Mage, The Hero Discovered, the original work of Matt Wagner, and also Grendel um, were published by Comico, right? Full color, fully lavishly painted color in this stuff. Looked like nothing else had an amazing story and man is uh, another one of my all-time faves not just of the era but just of all time later on we had sequels to this that you know just finished recently so this is a, a saga that spanned 30 40 years as well um the maze agency a detective book uh featuring the first work by adam hughes now legendary uh comics artist mostly known for his cover art and sort of good girl art and stuff but this is um, he was a really talented, fully formed guy from the beginning, did the interior of all the artwork on the Maze Agency. It was really a fun book. Um, Komiko also published some of the original issues of The Rocketeer, right? And if that's not a pedigree in itself to say that this was just sort of a different kind of company, like and putting out amazing comics decades and decades ahead of their time, um, then nothing will, right? Nothing will t convince you that if not this. So. Um, what's really great about it, uh, <laughs> what's really great about it is um, they put out some wonderful comics with incredible production values that really um, uh, exposed the world to new talents and new types of comics that undoubtedly influenced all the comics that came out of it. Now, unfortunately, um, the company went through different hands, right? And, and economically speaking, they had some problems. Uh, when they were uh, finally purchased... Um, Elementals was like their cash cow and they decided to do some stuff with distributing on the newsstand which meant uh, to went to bookstores and, and, and corner stores and stuff but they were returnable that meant they could they printed a lot more so their print runs went way up but then they got killed by the returns and so they had sort of a diminishing effect so this was in an era this was at the time and now in the, the 90s when this good the swimsuit issues were starting to become popular so they decided to cash in on the the fact that the elementals was a mature readers book that had characters that actually had sex and created started creating these sex specials and this is where elementals sort of went off the rails and went from being a a, a cool indie mature reader superhero comic into like porn and kind of sleazy stuff Still well done, still well written, and in fact, I haven't not. This is one of the few issues of Elementals I do not have. I don't have all the adult stuff that came later. I have some of the early stuff. Uh, this one supposedly has very early work by Frank Quitely. Okay, I'll believe it. Um, anybody out there seen it? Confirm it in the comments, huh? Um, 
So Willingham took some of the characters from Elemental, sold all of the main characters, and took a couple of them. Dave Dragavon and a couple of other fantasy-related characters that related to a Morningstar side plot. And went to straight porn comics at Eros, also uh, uh, the, the pornographic imprint of Fantagraphics Comics. This is a super high-quality porno comic. He wrote and drew it full of hardcore graphic sex, frankly, in black and white. Really well done and well drawn, sexy, but fun and great fantasy um, stories, dragons and sort of a, another fantasy type realm. Worth tracking down, expensive to find some of the issues I was just looking at. Um, there's a trade paperback featuring the first few issues. Man, really worth your time if you think that you can't have sex in a comic. I think this is way ahead of a Game of Thrones time. It's like Game of Thrones level sex. So um, with a fantasy setting. Again, decades ahead of um, George Martin. At least a couple. Um, so let's look at some of these comics, right? I've got the first appearance right here. Justice Machine Annual, number one, 1983 of Texas Comics. Let's just look at let's just look at the package in general. I mean, full color wraparound color cover. This one is in really good condition. I found it online for not very much at all. Um, beautiful artwork, full color artwork um, by Willingham, right? And this is like. Fathoms featuring Fathoms early ugly costume. The other characters were pretty much there. They all got redesigns later throughout the series and they changed in look and feel and stuff, but uh This is a good comic. Now this is eighty three, this is him as an early artist. So he got better. He's not this is not the greatest, but you can I think you can see the Michael Golden influence. I, I, the, the sort of cartooniness of in expression and, and figure work, which I think works really well. Um in a book like this. But you can see the fantasy influence, fantasy plus superhero influence brought together in a way that I hadn't really seen before, you know? They're a superhero comic, but it's really like a supernatural comic. It's not super science, it's it's magic that gave them their powers, uh, that motivate them and, and um, gave them their mission. So this was their first appearance. It's a great book. Um, but then here's the first five issues collected in trade paperback. Rather than open the individual issues, let's just look at the trade paperback a little bit. Um, now this includes, also includes this, those stories um, from the Justice Machine Annual. So that's great. If, if we take a look in here, I wanna look at, as the, we get to see the Destroyers and their characters, Annihilator and Chrysalis, all really cool rat man. He's a lycanthropic rat person. Um, they're all, again, brought back from the dead and have sort of supernatural-based powers, but they have these trappings of superheroes. And this is just like, this like turned something on in my head. Like, whoa, this is a different way of of doing things. Um, and so early on, uh, the elementals are captured by their, um, by the by the evil villain, Saker, right? And brought to his uh, secret island hideout very like super villain trappings but then we start to learn that this is not your typical uh super villain um basically saker is playing with very powerful dark supernatural forces essentially like a wizard with incredible power and and barely can control these forces that he's trying to um control and unleash on humanity and he's got these demons that are like coming out of his shadow spear, his giant like, it's almost like a nuclear generator for evil magic energy. And uh, and the creatures are getting out and trying to, to, to destroy him. He can barely contain them. Anyway, as the story goes on, they've captured the elementals. Great action, great art, fun designs, well-paced stories, just fun, really great fun comics of this era to read. Um, this is before the decompressed era of comics, too, so a lot goes on in every issue, so you get a lot of story in this trade paperback. But let's go to one of my favorite parts. This is the part that just flipped the switch for me. This is Saker's origin as as he reveals it to, um, to Morningstar. 
to Jeanette. And, and, and he says, they called for the opening of the grave. I do not ha know how I heard this. I had already been dead for days. I remember the larva that were clinging to my body. I shuddered as he pulled me up from my own resting place. Why have you taken me from the gates of the promised land, I cried. To show these people the power of the faith in me, he said. Such audacity. It might even be laughable if it were not so pathetic and devious. The witless throng sang his praises while I wept for a paradise lost. I fled civilization and awaited a death that has never come. I was bound to magical forces and they gave me no release. I watched that preacher die and I cursed him to his face and damned his name a thousand times before his end came. Now, if you can't read between the lines here, this is Jesus. This is like, he is he Methuselah? I think that's right. Um, who, who Jesus raised from the dead, but didn't real uh, makes Jesus out to be a charlatan in this. Uh, whatever your religious views, I'm not a re religious person, though I was raised one. So reading something like this was just shocking, and it was just a, a nobody ever called Jesus a charlatan before. You could call him a lot of things, but that was a weird way to go, and just it just started my mind down paths that um, you could argue were. Good or bad, that's up to you. But uh, these are amazing comics. Uh, so there were a lot of books that came out, right? There were series one. I've got the first. I've got the 29 first issues. I think that's the entire series. Series two, a similar number. Um, got a, I have up to, I think, 26 here. And then it was relaunched with a new number one, the series three. And just looking at, all you gotta do is look at this cover. You probably don't need to read this. If you're a completist, though, there's lots of weird stuff like this to track down. Um, so there's a, were also lots of little one-shots, um, specials, things that dealt with things like child abuse, things, th this, this particular issue deals with child abuse and was one of the first like ish comics to really even grapple with those types of issues and did it in a really like, I don't know, a, a special way. It's really a great series. Um, there's so much to read and enjoy here. And it was so influential um, on the art form of comics and the comics that came after it. I mean, if you talk to people from the 80s and about indie comics, elementals should come up right this is before we're talking about before the authority or planetary i mean decades before those things this was superheroes done you know in a fashion um that was for the mature reader but we're still fun and exciting adventures of like people with superpowers there were uh, the, the original series had so many great concepts um, I just want to look at some of my my favorite stuff. The, 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 they all have these beautiful wraparound covers. But man, there were characters... Man, this issue. This is a character called Sanction. Who was basically a broadcast telepath with multiple personalities. Who was programmed by the government with secret code phrases. If you said the code, right code phrase, you could make him switch his personality. And then his telepathy would kick in. And everybody would see him as the personality he saw in himself, right? This is something I had not seen in comics before. Here's one of his personalities. This is the second issue. Uh, uh, two, this was a two-issue story. These are just great. They are so well done um, that it's a little difficult to explain. You know, Willingham's take on vampires is a, just a disgusting creep called Captain Cadaver. Um so like you've got to you've got to read these you know if you like indie comics if you like superhero comics if you like mature reader comics there's a lot to love here um great art by willingham uh the second series mike leek and mike chen really great stuff unfortunately you know willingham sold all the rights of this character back to the publisher of Kamiko. 
and these have sort of just like disappeared. So nobody knows. Supposedly Dynamite Comics I was going to secure some of the rights to this, but um, they haven't. Or, or, or they've talked about it, but I haven't seen it yet. The one thing that did come out is this little book called Pantheon. Welcome to the Machine. Written by Willingham. Featuring art by Mike Leake. So similar to the Elementals team. And I'd read stuff where like this is supposedly the direction he wanted to take Elementals in the end and how he wanted to close it off. And this is sort of his answer to that. I, I don't see the totally direct parallels, but it is a really fun superhero comic um, full of, it's an entire universe of superheroes created by Willingham. A la like something like Astro City or something, but given the Willingham touch. So we got characters like Death Boy, uh, and uh, we got all these really like crazy, well thought out um, superhero supernatural concepts all brought together. This was actually meant to be a whole universe. There were spin off comics of this too. This character on the cover, Blackheart. Um, it, it never went anywhere. But there's issues of that to track down, and they're worth tracking down. Willingham has just such a interesting view on. Um, on his characters, like this Captain Cross character, these sort of religious characters. I forgot to mention in series two of Elementals, one of my favorite things was a whole super team he created called the Rapture, all based, all, each one had a different name and power set based on a, a biblical verse. But they were created by a, a crazy televangelist, like murdering, slaughtering thousands and thousands of people in the hopes that some of them would come back to life with these superpowers, like. Uh, the elementals and, and um, Saker's minions and stuff, and so twisted stuff, but uh, but 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 still classy. I mean, not it's not done in a way that's it, it's certainly shocking and was shocking to the little teenage Danny. But um, we've seen a lot uh, wilder stuff since then in comics, but not much that's as well done as this. So. Um, so I want you to seek out the elementals. You can find these issues. You can find them in, you can find the back issues, the key issues, the early stuff. You can find them online or wherever. But man, take a look in your quarter bins. Take a look in your bargain bins because these comics, especially from the second series and even a lot from the first, I've seen them in quarter sale after quarter sale and you will not uh, get a better quarter sale buy than an issue of elementals. In fact, I'd say every single one of these uh, issues with a few exceptions, um, holds up to this day as far as the storytelling, tone, and content. And because the production values were so high for their time, so far above what Marvel and DC were doing, that this stuff holds up with today's modern comics. This was a prototype for how to do mature readers, uh, superheroes, and do them right. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, you might like some of these other videos, so. Check them out. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And ring the bell if you want notifications of new videos.